everyone. Uh, I am Bruce Brinsdale, your room host for this breakout session. Uh, we are so excited that you have joined us today. Please mute your lines and use the chat function for questions. We will try and address all questions before the end of the session. Just a few housekeeping items. All sessions are being recorded. Please mute your lines and turn off your video while the presenters are presenting. Please click the chat icon, select all panelists and attendees, and enter your name, organization, and location. You may turn your video back on during our Q&A time. Each of you should have received a whiteboard paddle and marker in the mail. If you find something inspiring, exciting, or new, write a quick, quick adjective on the whiteboard, hold it up and let us know during the Q&A time at the end of the session. So that is all of kind of the startup stuff. So I'm going to turn this over to Jeff for introductions and uh, kind of let you guys run the meeting. So there you go. Thanks, Bruce. Hopefully uh, everyone can hear me. Um, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is essentially um, my tech basics. My name is Jeff Nishida. I am a partner with Novogratic and Company out of our San Francisco office. Um, I'm going to let my fellow panelists here uh, introduce themselves uh, as well. Um, I'll pass the virtual mic uh, to Melissa and uh, Melissa, can you introduce yourself and then pass it to John? Sure. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Jeff. Um, if I had the whiteboard paddle that said yay, I would say yay. Um, I'm sure that right now. Um, but I'm Melissa. I'm a principal in the San Francisco office of Novogratz and Company. Uh, we prepare audits and tax returns uh, for affordable housing developments. And more and more, we're also helping a lot, um, a lot of developers with uh, doing application work, um, helping consult with structuring um, as uh, for the initial uh, structuring as well as the year 15 exit. Um, yeah, John. Sure. Thanks, everybody. I'm John Galfioni. I'm with RBC Capital Markets and our Community Investments Group. Uh, we are a national syndicator of uh, low-income housing tax credits, and um, I'm based in Houston, but do a lot of work on the West Coast and in the in the Midwest and and Texas. So, very happy to be here. All right. Great. Thanks, John. Thanks, Melissa. Um, <clears throat> okay. So. Um, as we go through this today, we do encourage questions. Uh, hopefully, we're in, uh, not using too many acronyms. Hopefully, we're not going too fast. Uh, but this will be geared towards a more basic crowd. So if you are advanced, uh, you're going to have to bear with us because uh, we are going to go a little slow. Um, normally, this training, uh, John, Melissa, and I would be doing a, an entire day training on basics at one of our conferences. Uh, so we've crammed in as much as possible into this hour and a half. Uh, and, but again, hopefully I, we don't speak too fast for you. Um, and feel free to uh, ask questions as we go. So with that said, let's see if the advancing of the slides work here. Oh, I should probably give you slide. You should have slide control. Okay. Yep. There you go. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> so here is today's outline, 10 points. Like I said, it's going to go a little bit fast, but hopefully uh, we can uh, make it pretty clear and basic. Uh, we're going to start with affordable housing overview, just generally what is affordable housing. Um, we will talk about how the credits work at the state and national level. Uh, we will start looking at how to calculate the credit. <clears throat> we'll go over what is a typical uh, ownership structure uh, when uh, working with affordable housing. Uh, we'll talk about what tax credit pricing is and where pricing might be today. Uh, we'll look at qualified allocation plans. Um, we'll go over a timeline of generally how things work. We'll touch briefly upon ACT rehab deals. Uh, we'll talk about some very confusing things with minimum set-asides, income limits, and rent limits. Uh, and then at the end, we'll finish with how the credits are ultimately earned uh, and claimed. 
So affordable housing overview is where we're gonna start. <clears throat> and here we have our uh, unhappy tenant. Uh, this tenant uh, can afford $400 a month in rent uh, and is looking at this apartment complex. Uh, and unfortunately the developer is asking uh, for $700 uh, in rent. <clears throat> So you know, the tenant you know, tries to ask, you know, is there any units for 400? Can you lower your, your uh, rent to 400? Uh, but unfortunately, the developer cannot. And one of the primary reasons why they cannot is that they have financed their apartment complex with a lot of debt. And they have to pay down uh, this debt. They have their monthly um, mortgage payments, ultimately. And uh, if they lower their rent too much, uh, they're going to be underwater when it comes to their debt payments. Uh, and so they need 700. Our tenant needs 400. <clears throat> so in steps the uh, federal government. Uh, federal government realizes that there's a lot of uh, people out there who can't afford the normal, I guess you would say, market rate rents uh, and wanted to help uh, tenants um, with more what we call affordable housing. Uh, so affordable housing uh, is where we help lower the uh, rents required for a tenant to live there. <clears throat> and in 1986, uh, the US government created uh, IRC section 42, IRC being uh, the Internal Revenue Code, section 42, and section 42 is the low income housing tax credit. <clears throat> Uh, the low income housing tax credit uh, is available to developers who want to um, build affordable housing, but it comes with some rules. Um, if you are going to be using this tax credit, uh, you have to rent to tenants who have uh, who are under certain income limits. Uh, also, you have to rent it to them uh, under certain rent levels. Uh, and you have to build buildings that are um, suitable for occupancy. Hopefully that, that would make sense. And so what happens is that the government gives uh, the developer tax credits. Um, but unfortunately, the developer can't really use these tax credits. Tax credits are, are kind of like a coupon, kind of like a, actually a gift certificate. Maybe that's a better way to think about it. Um, that can be used a dollar for dollar uh, against your tax liability. Tax liability meaning how much you owe every year uh, to the government for taxes. Um, but in generally uh, speaking, developers don't owe a ton of tax liability. A lot of these projects might uh, provide uh, to a project uh, well over 100,000 in tax credits a year, maybe even up to a million uh, or even beyond a million. So developers don't owe the government that much in taxes. Uh, and there's also some other rules some passive activity uh, rules and, and such that they were individuals kind of have to watch out for. But at any rate, a developer can't use all the tax credits they normally receive. <clears throat> On the other hand, we have corporations. Uh, corporations usually have large tax liability, they can usually forecast their tax liability into the future. Uh, and so these corporations, uh, owe a lot of tax liability to the IRS. Uh, right now, these corporations tend to be banks. Um, almost every bank you can think of uh, kind of works in affordable housing uh, in one way or another right now. Uh, and so what developers do is they form this partnership with the banks or with these corporations. Because um, sometimes you do see, for example, some blue chip companies or some tech companies, um, but they form these partnerships uh, with these uh, corporations. Uh, it can be an LLC taxed as a partnership. <clears throat> so that way the tax credits can ultimately flow to the uh, corporations or we'll call them the investors, uh, which they can then use over uh, 10 years to pay down some of their tax liability, which makes them happy. Uh, they, in turn, invest in these projects. They provide contributions to help fund uh, the total project costs. And as you can see on the right side there, now our capital stack has changed. Uh, debt has gotten a lot smaller and equity has paid for a large portion. 
that makes the developer happy because equity does not require debt payments. Uh, and in addition, there's another program. Um, so there's two tax credits and we'll get into that a little bit more later. There is a 9% and the 4%, um, but you can also uh, build a project under the 4%, uh, which comes with taxes and bonds. Um, or probably a better way to say it is you apply for tax and bonds and tax credits come with them. Uh, and so that's possible as well. And so then the capital stack would change to have bonds with a lower interest rate or typically a lower interest rate uh, instead of some of that equity. Okay, <clears throat> so that's a very quick and brief overview of affordable housing in general and how the tax credit works. And we'll get into um, some more complicated uh, calculations in a little bit. Uh, we're going to now go ahead and look at how the credits uh, are allocated. So the um, federal government uh, actually uh, allocates the credits to the states to administer. So the states are actually in charge of figuring out which projects are going to receive the tax credits. Uh, they're also in charge of maintaining uh, the program, you know, watching over the program. Uh, and it's, uh, it's pretty much a, a huge um, partnership between the federal government and the states where the federal government relies a lot on the states uh, to administer uh, both the tax credit program and the tax and bond program. <clears throat> and we're just going to look at a, uh, a scenario here where uh, in Louisiana, and is basically a calculation, and in Louisiana in 2022, the approximate population was about 5 million people. And right now, uh, the tax credit is allocated based on population, and you get $2.60 per person. So that approximately comes out to about $13.1 million in credits. And you're provided those credits uh, over 10 years. So we're multiplying it by 10. So Louisiana, uh, in general, receives 131 million credits uh, in 2022. Uh, so if we kind of do a quick and dirty calculation, um, 331 million people in the United States multiplied by $2.60 would tell you that maybe we have 861 million in tax credits uh, in, in the United States uh, in 2022. Um, <clears throat> and ultimately 8.61 over the 10 years. Um, but that's not quite the case. So let's take a, a look at uh, Montana. So in Montana, the population is approximately 1.07 uh, million uh, people. And if we multiply that by 2.6, it comes out to about 2.78 million in tax credits. But there is a small population state minimum, uh, meaning that uh, small states will at least get 2.975 million uh, in tax credits. Uh, and so <clears throat> you get that over 10 years, you're actually going to get 29.75 uh, million in tax credits. So now that we know that there is a minimum, if we adjust that, it actually comes out to about 953 million uh, in tax credits or 9.53 billion uh, over 10 years. And this is just kind of a chart that kind of shows you uh, what tax, the amount of tax credits uh, have looked like over the years. Um, there's been a lot of different adjustments. Um, as you can see um, on this chart, we kind of explain a lot of them. Um, there's different uh, essentially boosts that we received over the years. Uh, a lot of them came uh, during downturns in the economy. Um, Let's see, somebody is asking, what was the small state minimum tax credit? So is I'm not sure if you're asking about the dollar amount. Let's see if I can go backwards here. <clears throat> but essentially it was 2.975. Okay. So you get uh, different uh, boosts uh, throughout the years, uh, and um, 
uh, like I said, it had to do with downturns in the economy uh, or disasters. And so um, we just have a few highlighted here. Uh, and um, as we all know right now, we need more affordable housing. Uh, and so Congress um, has created a boost uh, during 2018, 2019, and uh, 2020. Uh, I think 2021 as well. Uh, and um, that's kind of about to burn off. So um, we'll probably fall back down to kind of this uh, more orange trend without uh, Congress uh, acting. <clears> okay. <throat> hey. So now we're going to look uh, a little bit at calculating the credit more at the building level, more, uh, in other words, at the developer level um, or the project level. And this uh, slide here kind of explains it very basically without explaining what each word means. So we'll go into each word in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> but the basic math is this thing called eligible basis. And the way that I kind of tell people to think about it is eligible basis is closely related to depreciable basis, but it's not exactly the same. Um, then you can possibly have a boost in that number up to 30%. Um, and so uh, to the extent that you do receive the boost, you would multiply your algebra basis by the boost. Uh, and then there's this thing called the applicable fraction. And the way to think about that uh, is how many units in your project are actually low income versus say market rate. And uh, that's uh, how you would calculate this thing called qualified basis. And then you take qualified basis and you multiply it by this number that the IRS gives you, this tax credit percentage, uh, to calculate what your maximum housing uh, credits could be under, for example, the 9% program. Uh, but we'll get into all of this uh, with actual numbers in the next few slides. Uh, but we like to kind of give you just this real quick overview before we dive deep into the numbers. Okay, so. If we see here, uh, we uh, have this example of a, of a project where they have $10.8 million in total project costs. So this includes uh, everything uh, that they need, the land, the construction, uh, even soft costs during the construction period, uh, even reserves and such. And so uh, when we're talking about eligible basis, the ineligible costs are things such as the land uh, and any costs associated with that land, uh, marketing, so anything that's going to be expensed, um, organization costs, um, things that are often um, going to be amortized, uh, commercial property, um, so if you have like a, a retail store, that would not be eligible. Uh, and then there's this other smaller other things that uh, could also be ineligible that we won't necessarily get into today. So the things that are eligible costs for eligible basis uh, are build the building itself, <clears throat> uh, so the construction loan interest uh, that gets capitalized to the building during construction. Um, the developer's developer fee, which is uh, how they actually make uh, any money during uh, the construction, uh, the site works, uh, off-site improvements, personal property, um, anything that will get ultimately capitalized to the fixed assets um, as long as it's not commercial property. So in this example, to kind of make it easy, we're saying that the ineligible costs are 800,000, which would leave uh, 10 million in eligible basis. And ultimately what happens is you take that $10 million and you split it between how many ever buildings you have. So in our example here, we have two buildings. And you can see we uh, split it uh, 6 million in building A and 4 million in building B, generally split by uh, square footage. <laughs> this is just another diagram of a way to think of the different words we've been using. Total project costs being the larger outside circle, depreciable basis being the second circle, uh, 
algebra basis being within depreciable basis. And again, uh, primary difference between algebra basis and depreciable basis is the commercial portion. <clears throat> uh, and then you have obviously your residential rental units. Uh, and other types of space, say like a common area space, as long as they're reasonably required for the project, functionally related to the project, uh, and subordinate to the residential rental facility itself. Um, but common area space uh, does count as well. Okay, so back to our example here. Uh, we talked about the boost. So a project can receive up to a 30% boost. Uh, and that 30% boost is generally determined uh, based on where the project is located. Um, in this case, uh, we're talking about a qualified census tract. Uh, and uh, a qualified census tract is an area where 50% or more of the households have an income which is less than 60% of the area median income. Uh, and um, you can also get the 30% boost uh, for developing in what is called a difficult to develop area. Uh, and this is an area that has been determined to have a high construction uh, cost uh, in order to build there. <clears throat> and this is just to show you that if you have, haven't ever visited Novogradic's website, we have a ton of different tools on there, uh, including rent limits, income limits, uh, and in this case, uh, QCT, the Qualified Census Tract, and the DDA, Difficult to Develop Area Maps. Um, <clears throat> and you can pull up all of these uh, things uh, on our website. Usually, if you're a developer and you're looking to develop a project, you're going to want to know where the QCT and DDAs are because you could probably use the extra 30% boost. Okay, and when I say 30% boost, I've been saying up to 30% because the state allocating agency can decide um, a, do they want to give you a 30% boost? Um, they can also uh, they can also decide uh, to give you something smaller or less than that. Uh, and so in that case, um, you might only receive uh, say 20%. Uh, and it all has to do with this thing called financial feasibility, um, whether or not ultimately your project needs it. Uh, is what they're trying to determine. Okay, so here we are looking at our calculation uh, and we're uh, assuming that this project receives the full 30%. Uh, and in this case, um, they do, and we multiply their 6 million and their $4 million numbers uh, by 130%. <clears throat> And then we have to look at the next portion of the calculation, which was the applicable fraction. And the applicable fraction was a portion of your building that is low income versus say market rate. So as you can see uh, in these two buildings, the orange yellowish tint uh, is our affordable. So uh, in the first scenario here, um, the first building A has some market rate units and the second building B has none. Um, but it can be, you know, either way, it could be where they both have some, it could be where they both have none. Uh, and then the way that you have to think about it, though, is um, you have to look at both two different fractions, the unit fraction and the floor space fraction, and then you have to take the lower of the two. So in scenario one, you can see the green box is indicating that those are the low income units and four out of eight units are low income, which would mean the unit fraction is four over eight or 50%. <clears throat> um, but in this case, the low income housing units are smaller than the market rate units. And so the floor, spac uh, floor space fraction is actually lower, 35%. 
And so we would actually have to use 35% as our applicable fraction. Uh, scenario two is just the opposite, where the loan income units are now the larger. Uh, and um, we actually would use 50% in this case, uh, because we, again, we have to use the lesser. And so in our scenario, we're going to assume that 25% are market rate units. Uh, and so our applicable fraction for the building A is 75%. And for building B, it's 100%. Uh, and so we do some more calculations to get our qualified basis. <clears throat> and then again, this is just going back to that formula. Uh, we looked at algebra basis. We looked at the boost for the QCT or DDAs. We looked at the applicable fraction to get to our qualified basis. The applicable fraction was, again, what percentage is low income. Uh, and then so next, we're going to take that qualified basis, multiply by the tax credit percentage to get our maximum housing uh, credits. So in this case, <clears throat> we're going to look at a project uh, that is a 9% project, uh, kind of shrunk there. <clears throat> but as you can see, um, it's a 9% uh, multiplied by our qualified basis. And then multiplied by the 10 years is the total tax credits we're going to receive over our tax credit period over the 10 years, comes out to $9.95 million. <clears throat> and <clears throat> sorry, uh, and so in this case, uh, we're talking about 9% projects. Um, but again, I had mentioned that there's two there's a 9% and the 4%. Uh, and um, when tax credits come with a tax and bonds, that's what we call the 4%. Uh, and to the extent that this was a 4% project, you would substitute the 4% tax credit percentage uh, in the calculation, which, uh, as you can see, dropped the amount of credits uh, to $3.62 million. And that's just to show that it's a smaller sliver. Hey, Jeff, um, do you mind yes, going go back ahead. a slide? Yeah, which one? Or right there, yeah. So right. um, if you look at that smaller chart here, I just wanted to clarify a little bit. So if you look up 9% or 4% credits in section 42, you're not gonna find an instance of either of those terms. Um, those are more colloquial sort of slash picked up and adopted by the um, affordable housing industry as the versions, the actual, like the labels that they use now. If you're looking in section 42, what they're gonna be called are the 70% present value credit or the 30% present value credit for the 4%. And because essentially the tax credit should be about 70% of the present value of the cost of the project. Um, so over time you get that back, um, but based off of market conditions, you know, when it first started, it hovered around 9% uh, for the 70% present value. And for the 30%, um, it hovered around four. So that's why they're colloquially called that. And now uh, I think you're gonna talk about the floor later, right? So I will... uh, do I talk about the floor later? Or I think do you, you do. I think okay. you talk about the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so all those people, all those people are uh, showing you that really developers like the 9% uh, projects. Uh, I think we'll have a slide in a little bit that kind of shows you uh, how the 4% projects uh, are doing, but 9% projects uh, typically are oversubscribed, meaning when uh, developers apply to the state for 9% credits, um, they're often oversubscribed three or four to one. Uh, tax and bonds, the 4% credit, uh, in some states, uh, they don't use them up. Uh, and again, we'll have a, a picture of that in a little bit. Uh, but I will pass uh, the mic now to Melissa so she can go over ownership structure. Oh, I guess we don't really talk about 9% or 4%. Yeah, of course. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so actually, maybe we go back there a little bit. So this used to be a floating percentage, right? It's based off of market conditions um, and fluctuations. Um, recent, I guess not so recently anymore for the 9% because that's been a while, uh, but um, 
these have been, co uh, Congress approved a floor for either of these uh, credits. So that means the credit percentage can go up above 9% for competitive projects or over 4%, um, but at no point are they allowed to go below. Uh, so it used to be, you know, before the 9% floor, it used to be this tax credit percentage wasn't going to be nine, it was like around seven and a half. And then for 4% uh, before the floor is around 3% actually. So once they hit the floors, they, we actually got a lot more credits. It really helped um, figure, help us figure out what credit pricing was and, and that kind of thing wasn't as um, flexible or, or unknown anymore. Okay, so we talked about how credits are calculated. Um, now let's talk about how those credits are delivered to the ultimate users. So developer, right, they have a project. Um, so what they do is they're gonna form a partnership. So this is um, symbolized by this triangle. Um, and so they'll form a partnership with an investor in, so that would be a direct investment. So the investor would contribute money to this partnership to be used by the project. Or what's probably happening in most cases is actually the money will go from the investor to a fund and then from the fund to the operating partnership. Um, so now, you know, a lot of these investors, they have a lot of money, but they might not necessarily have the wherewithal to, or the knowledge to be able to figure out, you know, which investment's good. Um, and that's where John comes in, right? He's gonna, he's, he's a syndicator and he puts these funds together to help sell these portfolios to these investors. And so they'll manage, um, the fund will manage the sort of the, the comings and goings of these partnerships, uh, sorry, of these investments. So normally what we'll call them in our industry is the operating partnership will be called the lower tier, and then the fund uh, will be the upper tier. And so the syndicator is going to be making a partnership um, that's you know for the upper tier. The investor or investors will invest in that fund. And so the, that investor will be the limited partner, meaning that they will provide a lot of money, but they won't bear a lot of risk um, and they'll contribute this money to the fund. And then as a fee, John will take um, a bit of that money. And that fund will not only invest in just one lower tier, they're gonna invest in a whole bunch of different ones, right? They wanna hedge their risk. They have a lot of tax liability. They wanna invest in it as many as they can with that fixed amount of funds. And so, you know, these partnerships could be national. They could be state specific or city specific. It could be large family, you know, large family, they could be senior. So it's all about what the investor wants and what kind of appetite they have. But right now, let's just focus on this one partnership. This is the one lower tier that we've been talking about. And so again, like John, uh, Jeff was saying earlier, the developer will take a developer fee. Um, so that's what their money is. They're not gonna take tax credits. They're not really worth, they don't really have the, um, appetite for it. They don't have a lot of tax liability, but instead they can take this, um, <clears throat> this cash payment for putting the project together, monitoring the construction, um, and just making sure everything goes smoothly. So they'll get some of the developer fee upfront, and then um, some of it will be deferred um, into a payable that will be paid over uh, time through surplus cash. So if the project generates cash, um, it'll go to pay the developer fee down over time. So again, the limited partner, um, the fund will be a limited partner of this partnership. Again, they don't bear a lot of risk, but they provide all the money. And then the fund will contribute this money, oops. And then to pay back to the fund, what they'll get is they'll get credits. Right, so the tax credits will be 
allocated to the partnership. So they'll be allocated to the lower tier. The credits will then get passed up on K1s to the limited partner. And then it'll go up one more level to the ultimate investor. And the same thing happens with losses, right? So these partnerships generate a lot of loss, right? There's depreciation. You've got all this eligible and depreciable basis. You need to depreciate that. You have a lot of interest, right? You're making interest payments. So all of that will be um, losses that get delivered. And losses are actually a good thing. Um, they actually improve the yield, um, the return for the investors. And then sometimes there will also be cash, but John, you can correct me if I'm wrong. You guys don't normally take focus a lot on the cash distributions that maybe come go up to the investors. That's right. That's right. It's it's rare that we we value that as a as a real piece of our investment. And so there's all these outflows, right? All these um, outflows going up to the investor. The investors putting contributions in. And then the syndicator will also take an asset management fee every year. So it's just to help monitor, um, you know, to go for site visits, to make sure the tax return is done on time, the financial statements are done on time, and they get submitted to the investor. So we have all these benefits, we have all these inflows, we have all these outflows. So what does that mean? What will John pay? <laughs> So going back to Jeff's um, example, right? We have $9.95 million over 10 years in tax credits. Um, and so that's gonna go to the investor. So how much would the investor pay to the partnership for, this, um, for these credits? And so that is a lot of different factors. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about them. Um, and let John explain a little bit too. Um, but what we've seen, um, and maybe 115 is a little outdated, but uh, what we see is usually um, per credit, you'll get 80 cents to about $1.15 per credit. So let's take a little step pause right here, right? Why 80 cents to $1.15? Why that range? Um, there's a whole bunch of different factors that can go into that. So one of the biggest things is timing, right? So the later the investor contributes money to a project, the better their yield is. It's all basically ends up with rate of return um, to the investor. So the earlier that they get credits, the better it is. The earlier they get losses, the better it is. Um, and then for um, <clears throat> contributions, the later that they actually have to pay you, the better it is. John, do you, I don't know if you want to elaborate a little bit on this part. Yeah, no, actually you did a nice job. Um, I will say if anyone is getting a dollar 15 right now for their, for their credits, just take it and don't ask questions <laughs> and, uh, and run because you're getting a great deal. Um, no, so that, I, I, that's basically what it boils down to. It's timing of, of benefits uh, versus uh, outflows of equity. Um, you know, not, and obviously the tax credit award itself is, is such a valuable allocation, but it only, it only really translates to equity. And uh, once you have an investor who's willing to, to pay for that, that, that brings a, a project financing into the project. Um, so the largest drivers, I mean, why there's such a widespread of, uh, of pricing, um, and I would say recently, I know there's some, there's some uh, some outliers, but probably recently the highest we've seen is 95, 96, at least uh, across the market, but, but certainly down to 80 or sometimes a little bit less if there's a lot of equity going in during construction. Um, but largest drivers of pricing includes how, how quickly the equity is coming in. You know, there's always an equity contribution at closing. Let's call it 10 to 20 percent, depending on lender requirements and, and developer needs. Um, Usually there's another slug of equity coming in at completion and at conversion at 8609. Sometimes depending on the project financing, it needs to come in quicker. Occasionally the equity serves as, although it's rare, occasionally it serves as a substantial construction source. And so you have a, a good amount of equity coming in during construction, which will, will really uh, negatively affect pricing, um, but that, that's fairly rare. 
Um, and then timing of uh, timing of credit delivery uh, on an occupied rehab project, you often get a little um, a, a little boost in um, in pricing because you might be able to deliver the credits uh, quicker in some cases before the project's even completed construction. On a standard new construction project, you you are normally starting construction, building the project, leasing up, and then delivering credits. So that that takes a little bit longer. Um, sometimes it depends on how many just total losses, as Melissa mentioned earlier, uh, the credits themselves are, are one of the benefits uh, to the investor, but the the overall losses is also what drives our yield. And so you might have a project that has a lot of subordinate or soft financing that doesn't need to be repaid right away or can get repaid from cash flow and that has an interest rate on it. And so that might accumulate losses um, to the investor that would, that would sometimes be valuable. Um, and sometimes just project size, it's more efficient for us to place and to structure a larger project. So, so if you have a project that's uh, 200,000 of annual credits, that's gonna be a tough one to price high. If you have one that's a million of annual credits, often all else equal, your pricing is gonna be a little bit stronger on those. Um, and then one other fairly fundamental difference in pricing that we see is, is what type of investment structure a project is going to. So two, two primary buckets. Uh, one is a multi-investor type of fund where syndicators such as RBC will put together a fund um, with many investors. Let's call it 10 different investors and, and we'll have 10 or 15 projects in that fund. The advantage of that structure is you usually have a little more flexibility on what type of projects, what size of projects can go into the funds and what geography of the projects, but the pricing is usually not as strong. Um, on the other hand, you have proprietary funds where you will have still 10 or 12 different projects in a single fund, with a, but rather than multiple investors, there'll be a single investor in that fund. Pricing is usually stronger on those by a couple of pennies, uh, depending on the investor, but um, the number of the types of projects and the size of projects that fit into that investor's bucket are going to be smaller. So there's trade-offs, but that's another, that's another piece that um, that really can affect uh, overall pricing to the project. And then is this a good time to also maybe talk a little bit about CRA and possibly that affecting pricing too? Sure. Yeah. And the other, and the other bucket would be um, CRAs, as most people know, the uh, banks have a, a certain mandate to, to invest in certain areas where, where they get deposits. And so, you know, every couple of years, a, a bank has a, uh, a CRA exam cycle where they uh, are allocated certain uh, kind of buckets and, and geographies that they need to invest in. Um, and that sometimes allows banks to invest with, with the overall goal being more CRA um, motivated than economics motivated. So it, it becomes less of a, it becomes less of an IRR discussion where, you know, Everyone generally in the investor market is within a fairly narrow band of what IRR they're looking for. Whereas uh, once CRA enters into it, banks are willing to go below that band of, of what would be a normal uh, IRR or return on their investment um, uh, to put money in a certain geography so that they can, they can pass their CRA exam. Often um, that ends up being larger uh, uh, cities and, and uh, MSAs where that that attract the CR investment that, that because that's where the majority of deposits end up being and that are sizable enough to to fund a tax credit type of project but not not always but that's generally where the CR investments end up and so that is uh, Melissa's right that is uh, another uh, it can be a fairly major driver of of pricing difference among investors. So John, if I was a new developer, what would you recommend uh, me looking at in Montana? Well, in terms of pricing, I think somewhere in one of these slides, uh, I think there's a, a base assumption of 85 cents. Um, and I, I don't think that that is, um, I don't think that's a bad assumption right now. Um, you know, depending on the project size, I think if you're going a lower project, um, you know, less than five million of equity, I, I would recommend going a little lower than that. If you're going to be a larger project, I think you can come up a little bit and um, and talk to your to your syndicator investor partners. I mean, there may be an investor, an upper tier investor, and I think it was either Jeff or, or Melissa that talked about 
kind of the, what the upper tier means. But the end, when I say upper tier investor, end user investors who might have, who really might really have need be a CRA or or other uh, or otherwise for a certain type of project in a certain area who who can really throw off the pricing, at, you know, usually for the better. Uh, that might break that assumption. But that's usually the conversation that I'm having um, with our folks on a normal equity schedule, um, which is, like I said before, some some equity at closing and then the majority at com construction completion beyond. I, I think mid 80s is not a bad place to start. Um, that used to be much higher uh, pre-tax reform that I think we'll, we, we may talk about here in one of these slides, but um, I, I think that is a good assumption to start with is you're putting together a uh, just a basic pro forma and thinking about credits. And, and I think something good to point out is that you guys are willing to talk to developers early uh, before they might even have a project to give you, them some ideas on what might be good, what size might be good, where a location might be good and, and things yeah. to even avoid. Yeah. No, I, I, and I think that's, I, I think that's beneficial to everyone. It gives us a chance to uh, help craft, craft an investment that's easier to, to close on our side and, and might be advantageous to the pricing on, on the developer side. And also, you know, like I said earlier, pricing can swing if it's a, if it's a rehab project, if it's an occupied versus a vacant rehab, if it's a uh, new construction, there are assumptions around um, depreciation and bonus depreciation that can really boost uh, pricing or, or hurt pricing by a couple of pennies. Um, and so I do, I, I do suggest going out and talking to your syndicator partners or, or starting to develop that relationship because we are having those conversations at the time of and usually before application with a lot of our developers just to make sure that we're all on the same page and they don't go in with an application at 92 cents and turn around and get 85 cents and all of a sudden there's a big gap and, and the state agency is wondering uh, what they were doing. Yeah, I, I think that is something unique to this industry is that in general, everyone wants to work well together, right? And even the states chip in, they talk to you early, you know, they're willing to help you think about your project too. It's, it's a, it just seems like a lot more community in this industry. Yeah, no, I agree. And just because you're talking to, to someone before your application is structuring, that doesn't mean that's ultimately who you're going to go with both on the debt or the equity side. Um, you know, you're just trying to get feedback in the market and then, once you have a real life deal, that's probably where you will go out and start soliciting um, an equity investment or, or, or debt for your project and, and really firm up pricing and assumptions. But having those initial conversations around pricing, around structure, around distribution, when I say distribution, that means you know who, who the possible end investors will be. Those are all real fundamental conversations to have early on. Yeah. Um, let's see, Melissa, anything else from me on this slide? Well, yeah, I think we'll come back to you a little bit more later too. I think, uh, sort of retouching on some of the items that we just sort of brief glanced, glanced over. Right. Um, yeah, we're going to get into the numbers cause we're accountants. So gotta love those formulas. <laughs> um, so yeah, like John was saying, you know, this slide is showing in this case, 85 cents uh, per credit. Oh, um, and then one other thing was, so I, this is obviously more rare or this is more rare now, but why would someone pay more than a dollar for a dollar's worth of credits? And so again, remember that we're not only, or the lower tier isn't only delivering credits to the investor, they're also providing losses. So when John's talking about bonus depreciation and losses, you know, where the more losses you can deliver and the earlier you can deliver them, um, the better because those losses aren't dollar for dollar reductions, but they're 21 cents or they're worth whatever the corporate tax rate is. So going back to this benefits schedule, sorry, remember it's credits, and losses and to a very small extent cash. So you can get the credit. So that'll be $1 and then plus some other benefit, some amount of benefit from the losses. Also time value of money, mm -hmm. right? 
equity a little bit comes in, in the beginning uh, and then the rest might not come in for over a year. Uh, so a dollar today, dollar tomorrow have different values. Right. Okay, so back to 85 cents. So we're assuming 85 cents um, for this $9.95 million of tax credits. So what does that look like in equity? So we'll multiply the $9.95 million of credits by 85 cents per credit. And that'll give us 8.46, so almost eight and a half million dollars worth of equity from the upper tier. So that for this example, this $10.8 million that the developer is spending, 78% of the project will be paid for by equity. And that's partially because of this sort of extra amount from this boost, right? We're getting this extra credit because we are putting this project in a place that's harder to develop, or you know, it's it usually is a bit more deeper skewed in um, affordability or incomes incomes um, earned by the people there. So, seventy eight percent of this project is going to be funded by tax credit equity, which means that only a small portion needs to be debt financed. Again, we're bringing that debt service down so that way. Um, the developer can charge less to tenants and so they can afford, you know, the developer can afford to pay the mortgage and then the tenants can afford to pay the rent there. So on the other hand, if it is um, private activity bonds, right, so if we're going for 4%, uh, so for volume cap bonds, as well as 4% credits, these are called federally subsidized uh, projects, instead of getting the 9% credit, you'll end up with a 4% credit. And so obviously the credits get chopped by more than half. So $4.42 million in this case of credits times the 85 cents only gets us $3.76 million worth of equity. So in this case, only 35% of the project is gonna be financed by equity a big chunk of it. So at least the majority of it will be financed by bonds. And then some other amount funded by um, soft loans. So that could be loans from the city or the county or the state. Um, it would be financed by the amount of developer fee that's not paid upfront. So that's basically what your capital stack looks like. So if you look at our website, so we're gonna mention our website a few times here. Um, you can take a look at the data and tools section like Jeff was talking about for the QCT and DDA maps. There's a section called LIHTC pricing trends. What we've been doing is tracking the, the price per credit um, over the years. Um, so this is a more recent schedule um, and you can see um, back in 2016, the price was over a dollar on average per credit. And then all of a sudden something happened here. And now we're hovering around, you know, high night, like uh, low 90s. So what happened here in the winter of 2016, uh, 17 was the um, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. So this dropped the corporate tax rate from 35% percent to 21 percent meaning the loss it won the corporations had less tax liability and two the losses that the credits were or the the partnerships were generating weren't worth as much right so before they're worth 35 cents on the dollar and now they're only worth 21 cents and so there was a um, a nice little dip here or not so nice little dip Sorry, if everybody could mute their phones, that would be, or their Zooms, that would be really good. And so here, I don't know, John, if you want to expand a little bit more on this market correction here. No, I mean, that's, you hit the main thing. I mean, it's just the, you alluded to earlier that, you know, we'll come back to this. A tax credit is a tax credit, it's worth a dollar, no matter what the tax rate is. But the other, the other bundle of benefits that investor is investing in is are these losses that are generated from interest, operating costs, depreciation, 
uh, other things that can be amortized. Um, and that is a, a deduction against a, against income. So while that used to be worth 35 cents, it's now worth 21 cents for, for a standard corporation at the normal corporate tax rate. So that's why tax credit bright, uh, pricing dropped so significantly. It was, you know, all else equal to get back to the same investment yield. You have to drop pricing since a, part, a substantial part of your value, it just, just went down. And then it's it's been fairly stable. There was a little bit of a have a bump downward in, in early 2020 with um, just with COVID and some some fallout from the market there that was certainly less dramatic. But I think just, you know, if everyone can think back to early 2020, things were just kind of in chaos and in all sorts of directions, but nothing too, uh, nothing too major. I mean, it's been, a, it, it's been fairly stable since then. I mean, no one, no one has a crystal ball uh, and I would not try to predict anything at this point, but just with interest rates, and that is an official disclaimer, I'm not predicting anything, but with interest rates going up, um, you know, investors are looking at what their other options are uh, to place money in the market. So it, it would be likely um, rates going up, rates and pricing are usually inversely correlated. So uh, rates go up, pricing goes down, uh, all is equal. So I would not anticipate pricing to go up. If anything, it would, it would trend downward over the next uh, year or so, if, if I had to guess. I was going to uh, equity panel you and ask you to guess, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that's just kind of the natural course of economics is that that is the likely direction uh, as rates, as we all anticipate rates to continue coming up over this year. Okay, so I think um, we can talk about this, about this a little bit, but I do want to make sure we have enough time for the other part of the um, the slide deck. Um, and so I think you actually touched up a lot on a lot of this already, John, um, in terms of what syndicators would prefer uh, for projects. Yeah, I, I can briefly run through these, but they're, they're fairly straightforward. I mean, we I, the list to the left hand column is is the, the, with the diamonds on it, some of the primary items we're looking for. I would say first and foremost, a uh, strong developer, experienced developer. Th this is the first question we're asking. Someone, you know, we are looking for, it's a steep learning curve in the tax credit industry. And so we are looking for someone who has worked in this industry, has built and operated tax credit housing. If if that is not you and you want to, to build um, housing for your community, I strongly suggest partnering with someone, finding someone who, who has this experience that can guide you through it. And then kind of in the same vein, the guarantees, we're looking someone for someone with a balance sheet uh, that can cover you know, things that ultimately could go wrong during, uh, during the course of a real estate investment, which is uh, cost overruns during construction, um, operating deficits during um, operations if something doesn't quite go right. Um, you know, making sure you have a strong market. If your market city comes back and is is somewhat lukewarm or, or doesn't illustrate a clear demand in the market, really really look hard at that project. Um, and then just sound underwriting. You know, do the rents make sense for the market? Do the expenses make sense? Does your construction time frame? You know, especially given that almost every project seems to be delayed these days, um, we just want to make sure all that makes sense and and do that upfront. I would say those are the primary ones. OK. Um, so again, um, here sort of the look at the sources and uses. So uses being what you spend money on, and the sources being where the money's coming from. Um, so we were looking at this. I'm not going to go into this a little um, too much anymore, because um, we've sort of explained these concepts previously. And so um, this, again, we're talking about timing of capital contributions. Um, and so John went into this earlier too, talking about some small amount of money coming in from um, equity at the beginning, you know, closing the partnership, purchasing the land, um, you know, sort of reimbursing all those pre-development costs, maybe some money coming in that construction completion at some point uh, partial construction completion anyway. 
and then a big chunk of it coming in at um, when the project is placed in service. Right, you get your certificates of occupancy, making sure that you can move everybody in, then making sure that you can maintain the operating expenses and the income for a period of three months. And then a small little bit at the very end reserved for when you actually get these 8609s, which is this magical piece of paper that says, you get these tax credits now, these are yours with uh, some requirements, <laughs> with some strings. Um, so let's talk a little bit about qualified allocation plans. Um, so qualified allocation plans are the rules that the state or credit other credit agencies use to govern the age, the credit program within their various states. Um, the we on our website again have a link to all of the current qualified allocation plans. Um, again, they vary from state to state. And so you're going to want to look there to make sure you have the most up to date rules, or you can go on the state agency sites as well. So, uh, you know, we talked about or Jeff talked about this federal state partnership to out administer these credits. The federal law, the actual internal revenue code says very little about what the states should do. They, this is all it says. It says you have to include some criteria to give some type of type of preference and then make sure you're making uh, monitoring the projects over time. That's all it says. It's up to the state to figure out what that means for their population, right? What makes sense to build, um, you know, there are certain areas that they might want to reflect on um, to build or create more housing in uh, versus others. So it talks about these certain items that they need to consider, but it doesn't say how to consider them. So a state could be like, I want the least energy efficient project to win. Not, no one's doing that, but they technically could. Um, so it's really, again, up to the state to figure out how they want to, um, to build this housing and how to spend these, this federal money. Uh, but they do say that they do want to make sure that the the agencies serve the lowest income tenants, right? They give priority to those for the longest periods of time. So even past the normal 10 or 15 year period of time, um, the actually um, the IRS says you actually have to keep the project compliance for 30 years. So beyond that, and then located in certain areas. So really free reign to the states. That's sort of really, so, you know, if you're going from state to state, make sure you're checking that individual state's rules because they will vary. You know, developer fee percentage might vary. Um, the types of units might vary. And then I'll pass it off to Jeff. Okay, we have a little bit less than 30 minutes left. We would like to leave a little bit of room at the end too. So let's see here. Of course, it doesn't want me to go. I'll just press this button. Okay. <laughs> so uh, developer timeline. Um, <clears throat> this is an example. And in this case, uh, this developer receives a reservation of 9% credits uh, during 2021. Uh, and the rules state that the developer must place in service this project by the end of that year, which is virtually impossible. Um, I don't know if I've ever seen it happen. Uh, and, um, you know, how could, like, if this was a new construction, you'd have only so many months to uh, finish this building, which uh, never happens. So there is another rule <clears throat> that allows a developer to take more time, uh, as you can see, two more years. Uh, they do have to apply to the state for what we call a carryover request or carryover allocation. Um, <clears throat> they submit it to the state. Uh, they must meet this thing called a 10% test. 
uh, essentially, the idea behind the 10% test is to show uh, that you're actually moving your project along, uh, that you've spent some money, that you're well vested in uh, this venture. Uh, and the way that they look at this test is they say that you must spend at least 10% of your reasonably expected basis. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, essentially, uh, as we put there, it's that your fixed assets at construction completion or say land plus depreciable basis. Uh, it is your guesstimate of what you're going to spend because um, it's a, it's a forward looking number. It's a future number. Uh, and you must spend at least 10%. So we always like to see something like 13, 12, 13, 14, 15% uh, percent spent uh, before the deadline. Um, usually your land is actually going to uh, help you qualify uh, by itself, but um, not always. And to the extent that you do spend at least 10%, uh, you uh, can extend that place and service due date uh, so in this case, if you had a $5.3 million project, you'd have to spend at least $530,000, not $529.999. Uh, to the extent that you do not meet the test, you would have to um, place in service by the original deadline, which would just cause a whole bunch of problems. It's essentially, it's a cliff test. You'd have to give back your reservation. So many um, things going to happen. And uh, you'd probably get negative points with your state and your investor is going to now not be able to receive anything. Your developers uh, not going to be able to put together the project. Uh, and so therefore it is a very, very uh, important test. Uh, and you really have to understand um, how much you're spending um, and compare it to your reasonably expected basis. So again, we're happy that we're meeting the test. Okay, <clears throat> so here's our, our project. Uh, we have a lender, a bank at, at the top middle. Uh, we have an investor on the right side. I don't know if you hear that noise, but I know that when I was, I don't hear it now, but I know that when I was running through, it scared me because it's super loud. <laughs> um, but we construct the project. Uh, and then we have our inspectors come out to check and inspect the project so that way we can get our certificates of occupancy our cfos we get both temporary and final cfos <clears throat> we then will go hire a property manager we then invite tenants in we usually oversubscribe so usually that's not a problem uh, we then have to put together our place and service package uh, for the state uh, which includes our CFOs, our certificates of occupancy. Uh, also, it will include some other documents listed here. Uh, the final cost certification, for sure. That is the audit done by Melissa or myself, by your accountants, on the total project costs that you ultimately have spent. So it's uh, typically done a few months after you place a building in service. Uh, it does take a little while. We do have to look at a lot of invoices. <clears throat> but we all put all that together and we turn it into the state. So that way the state can prepare our regulatory agreement and our form 8609s, which Melissa referred to earlier, which are the magical IRS forms that give us the final amount of credits we're going to uh, receive. You know, in this case, uh, this is a uh, $250,000 uh, credit project. Apparently it's a 9%. The maximum qualified basis is essentially the qualified basis you need in order to get to that $250,000 number. Uh, that next line 3B is where we would normally see the boost. So this one has no boost since it's zero, zero versus say three, zero. Uh, <clears throat> oops, and then uh, since this is a 9% project, uh, you won't have anything here as well. And so the Form A609s are the ultimate thing that we want to receive. So that way we can then also submit them to the IRS uh, and we can start taking tax credits on our project. And in our case, we received 450,000 of them, which goes to the fund, which goes to its investor to pay down its tax liability on its tax turn. 
And again, it happens over a tax uh, credit, uh, 10 tax credit years, uh, which uh, is often 11 years really, because the first year is like prorated and then the 11th year you take the back end. Uh, and to kind of look at our timeline here, um, and we kind of talked a lot, a lot about this timeline already, um, but usually we'll um, put together a partnership. We'll start lining up uh, our attorneys, our architects, accountants, etc. cetera. Um, <clears throat> we'll put together a forecast to kind of show the investor uh, what we're thinking. Um, we'll, uh, at that point, we'll get uh, some sort of like a letter of intent from the investor so that way we can apply for tax credits. And again, as John had mentioned, you may or may not end up with that final investor. Um, we'll also do a market study. Um, Novogratik has a valuation arm that does things like market studies and appraisals. Uh, we'll also um, uh, wait for our application to be accepted so that way we can receive a reservation of credits. So to the extent we receive the reservation credits, yay, we're happy, we can now go. <clears throat> we have to pass that 10% test we just talked about. Um, this is also where the investor really comes in. Then we'll have to finish our construction. We'll have to do that audit of all the costs. Uh, we submit that place and service package, as we said. Then we also talked about the regulatory agreement. Uh, as soon as the project is complete, we'll start leasing up to get tenants in. Uh, and then the 86 and nines that we talked about. Uh, and then from then on, we'll have to get yearly audits because ultimately these projects are, in, like I said, invested in uh, by banks and other uh, large corporations who have their annual audits. So everything they invest in uh, ultimately has to also be audited. Uh, and this was the 9% um, timeline. If you uh, want to look quickly at the 4% or the bonds, taxes and bonds, instead of receiving um, an allocation of tax credits, we receive an allocation of tax and bonds, and the tax credits just automatically come with the bonds. Um, we receive our bond allocation, and then we issue the bonds. Uh, there is something called a 50% test. Uh, essentially, that just that the bonds have to pay for at least 50% uh, of our, what we call our uh, aggregate basis in land. Uh, so very similar to the reasonably expected basis, but the ultimately the actual costs. Um, <clears throat> and here's a slide that I mentioned a while back. Um, you can take a look at this. This is kind of interesting. This is a, a newer uh, map that we're putting together. Um, it's showing you the states where the 4% tax credit is oversubscribed. So those are the blue states. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, undersubscribed. The blue states are the undersubscribed. The oversubscribed are the orange states. Uh, so a lot of the coasts uh, and uh, states with larger population are probably the oversubscribed states. Uh, and so the blue states uh, are undersubscribed. And what would I mean by undersubscribed? It means that uh, it isn't as competitive. Um, you won't have necessarily more developers uh, looking for taxes and bonds than you actually have. Uh, and uh, so in Montana, for example, we're still undersubscribed um, and still looking for developers who uh, want to uh, develop 4% projects. Um, but uh, say maybe seven, eight years ago, um, this map would have been pretty much all blue, um, especially after uh, the 2008 uh, recession. Um, there are many states who weren't doing any tax and bond projects for a long time. Uh, I remember um, after about four or five years, uh, Colorado calling me up saying, Jeff, uh, can you walk us through a tax and bond project again? Because we don't remember how to do it. <laughs> okay, so um, this is just to confuse you. The slide is only here to confuse you. Uh, it is to show you that there are a lot of people involved in a tax and bond project. Um, there are a lot of fees. There are you know, uh, just a lot of different things going on. We actually do have a tax exempt uh, bond training, but that too is almost a 
half day, if not a full day uh, training. So we can't get into it all right now. Um, but just know um, that tax and bond projects are typically larger. So that way you can um, spread these costs over more units. Uh, and uh, there's a lot more uh, fees from banks and, and lawyers. Um, <clears throat> this slide is just trying to, I, I think it's just kind of summarizing some of the things we just said, um, that there's more competition for 9% tax credits, uh, there's more fees for 4%, um, but a 4% generally should have a lower interest rate, tax exempt uh, interest rate, um, but there's more debt on a 4%. Um, but on a 9%, because it's more competitive, uh, states do require deeper income targeting uh, for your project. Okay, and this is just looking at a 4% project, uh, as we kind of looked at a little bit earlier. Um, and if we were to receive uh, $4 million in tax credits uh, at 85 uh, since we would have 3.76 million in equity, uh, which in this case is paying for about 35% of the project. Uh, as we had mentioned, um, bonds have this thing called the 50% test. It's not necessarily 50% of the total project cost, it's 50% of um, aggregate basis uh, and, and land. So it's a little bit smaller than total project cost, but essentially bonds pay for about 50% of your project costs. So we have a 15% gap in this case. Uh, and Melissa mentioned earlier that you'll pay for this with soft debt. You'll pay for it with your deferred developer fee. Um, hopefully you don't pay for it out of your own pocket. And so this is just highlighting the 50% test that we had talked about. Uh, aggregate basis here is um, less than the total project cost because there's other things in total project costs that aren't fixed assets like reserves uh, or expenses. And so you'd have to spend at least $5.2 million uh, or you'd have, to, you'd have to fund at least $5.2 million with your bonds. Uh, to the extent that it's under, that would cause a whole bunch of problems because your eligible basis essentially gets cut in half. Um, you multiply it essentially by the 4.9. 9.999, uh, 49.999, uh, which just causes everything, all these more gaps, all these more problems, uh, as you can see on the screen. Um, so not a cliff test like the 10% test, but a, essentially a very painful and almost cliff in, in another way test. <laughs> um, and so just make sure that you're spending um, bonds on at least 50% of the aggregate basis uh, to clear that. And I think I pass it back to you, Mosa, for ACK Rehabs. Indeed. OK, so we've been talking about new construction this entire time, right? We're talking about buying um, vacant land and then constructing on it. But there's another type of um, lie tech that you can apply for. Um, so ooh, I, can, I can hear the sound, um, and it's very loud in my ears. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, so you can build from scratch, right? Build from ground uh, from ground up. So if it, we're talking about competitive uh, comp um, credits, so 9%, we call this 9% new construction. Or you can buy an existing building and then rehab it up. Um, so, you know, you're swapping out the appliances, you're maybe bringing it up to the current code. Um, you are you know add doing maybe the roof needs repair or you are just you know painting it again things like that and that is what we're calling nine percent ACK rehab so you're going to acquire the old and then rehab it in this case instead of getting 18609 for the building for the new construction in this case you get two so one for the existing building itself and then one for the new construction that you're putting on so the repairs. <clears throat> so these, this is a very specific carve out of the type of tax credit. So there's certain particular peculiarities that go with it too. Um, and so this is how you fill out again, the magic piece of paper that says these are the credits that you get. 
there are different boxes explaining the different types of um, building this is. So it could be newly constructed and federally subsidized. So that would be tax exempt bond new construction. So 4% new construction. Newly constructed and not federally subsidized. So that's 9% new construction. Then we've got ACK rehab. And so that could either fall into existing building for the ACK or section 42 rehab expenditures that are um, for the new, the new, the repair portion. So tax percentages. So what kind of tax credits do you get for this, for this kind of special project? So nine new construction, right? Competitive. It's really simple. You just get 9%. For acquisition, <clears throat> For rehab, you get 9%, so that's easy enough. But for acquisition, even though you're going for competitive credits, you're gonna end up with the 4% tax credit rate rather than the 9% credit rate. And essentially the reason why they're doing this is because they wanna incentivize the rehab piece, not just buying an old project. So they're trying to get you to expend more here rather than just buying the, <clears throat> the existing building. That doesn't mean you apply for bonds and or 9%. That just means that you apply for competitive. Number two, so we talked about the boost earlier. So the 30, up to 30% boost. New construction and rehab, again, it's the same. You're eligible for the QCT boost, the DDA boost or um, state designation. For the acquisition piece, you don't get this extra credit again. So again, try not to incentivize just buying an old building and not doing anything with it. Again, we've written this out into words, um, sort of explaining the different types of uh, projects and the construction types. And so that's sort of what is specific about ACK rehabs. There are a lot more details um, that go into it, but uh, probably not really for a Live Tech 101 class. Um, okay, so briefly we'll talk about minimum set aside income limits and rent limits. So the minimum set aside is yet another one of these cliff tests. <laughs> um, so basically you have to have a minimum, the least amount of units set aside for low income tenants. So there's three separate set asides. There is, so if you don't meet the set aside, this minimum set aside, you do not get your credits, you will lose them. So it's very, very important to make sure that this, <clears throat> that this minimum set aside is always met. And so the first set aside that we see is the what we call the 20 at 50 set aside. So that's 20% of the units or more are set aside for people who have incomes 50% or less of the area median income. Or we have the 40 at 60 um, <clears throat> minimum set aside and that's 40% of the units are set aside for people that earn less than 60% of the area median income. And then we got this new fandangled one called the um, income, the average income set aside. And so this one's a little hard to explain, but I'll try my best. So 40% of the units are set aside um, for an average of 60% of area median income, meaning you can have units that are at 20%, 30%, all the way up to 80%. So in these 10% increments, as long as the units on average, um, average is 60% of area median income. So that means for every 80% uh, unit, you could have a 40% unit, cause then that would average to 60. <clears throat> and then, so it's sort of this kind of game that you end up having to play. There's a whole bunch of different ways to do it. Um, not a lot of people are doing this because the rules are very complicated and 
Um, right now, the IRS still hasn't finalized the rules on how this gets administered. So investors are a little bit wary. So um, not as many people are using it, but this is a sort of a good way to get some of the Middle, like the workforce housing folks to be able, the workforce to be able to get um, more affordable housing. So the great thing of this is if you go to our website, you don't have to figure out how to calculate these rent limits um, or what the income limits are. You can use our website, go to our handy dandy Novogratic rent income limit calculator, enter in a bunch of stats, and it'll pop out the income limits for you as well as the rent limits for you. And so it's a really easy way to do it. You just have to know certain specifics about the project. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about how credits are earned and claimed. So there's a different types of periods for tax credit uh, projects. There is the tax credit period. So what you earn, what you claim them over, so that's 10-ish years. There's a compliance period, so that's where you earn the credits over, so that's 15 years. And then the extended use period, which is at least 30 years. So <clears throat> what this means is during this period is when the investor and you will be claiming these credits on the tax returns. If something happens within this 15 year period, some of these credits might get lost or might have to be returned um, and then the tax liability goes up. But if anything happens in this period, right, from year 16 on, nothing really happens to the credits. Um, it ends up being more of a state issue. So the state might give you negative points for applying, you know, they might um, fine you, uh, but nothing federally happens to your credits. So the compliance period is also what we call the credit recapture period, because if you mess up, so if you rent to people whose incomes are too high, you charge too much rent, or the units don't become suitable for occupancy, right? If they fall out of code, if they're not livable, um, some of the credits that you claim might get lost. So normally we would go into how this would be calculated, but you can join us at one of our conferences during this pre-conference workshop and, and, and find out more there. So again, you wanna make sure you meet your minimum set aside, then make sure you maintain all the credits, make sure you get your income limits or you meet the income limits and the rent limits. Otherwise you have what's called non-compliance. Sorry, so I know we sort of sped through that very last bit a little quickly. Um, we try to open it up for some questions if anybody has any at this point. Yeah, I think if, if we had a, a question or two here, um, just unmute your mic and ask it if you have it. You guys did a great job though. I mean, I think you covered it well. So well, there's no questions. You guys did great. <laughs> so everybody knows everything now. Great. <laughs> oh, man, these guys are smart. <laughs> well, I've got kind of a final thing here. So I want to thank everyone for joining. This concludes our day together. We hope that you can all join an in-person networking event from 4 to 5.30 this evening. Um, check the conference website for more information on where those are taking place. Uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning for our plenary session at 9 a.m. So with that, thank you, panel. Uh, a wonderful job. I've done tax credits for a lot of years, and it was very, very understandable. So thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you.